So uh, thank you again for, uh, for joining us. Uh, this morning, we're going to be looking at Hebrews chapter 13, and we're going to be looking at the, uh, the first six verses uh, of the chapter there. But uh, I want to talk to you this morning about living a life of worship. And uh, when we talk about worship, most of us, we automatically default to the weekly public gathering of the body as worship. We come in, uh, we sing, sing a few songs, we collect an offering, we hear a message. Uh, but in light of our current circumstances, gathering together is simply not an option. And we don't know how long this is going to last. Uh, it could be a week, it could be two weeks, it could be longer. We just don't know. We, we face many questions uh, of what the future holds for us, both individually and corporately. But I, I want to I share with you, worship is not solely about gathering together. It's not necessarily about singing uh, some songs listening to me drone on and on for about 45 minutes. Uh, but uh, worship goes beyond that. Our lives should be characterized by a worshipful attitude. Uh, as we uh, wrap up this study of Hebrews this morning, we're going to be looking uh, at the, the 13th chapter of Hebrews. Uh, but we're going to see this morning what a life characterized by worship truly looks like. Uh, for, for those of you that may be joining us for the first time this morning, uh, I want to share with you a little bit of why the writer of Hebrews, he wrote this letter. He was writing to a letter, he was writing this letter to a group of Jewish Christians. Uh, they had started to experience some very intense persecution. Uh, he wrote this letter to encourage the readers to finish strong in their faith, to not fall back, to not shrink back from their faith. He encourages them to hold fast in their faith and endure to the very end, regardless of what that end may be. And I want to read for you the, uh, the first six verses of Hebrews chapter 13, and we're going to see some directions here. He says, let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. Remember those who are in prison as though in prison with them, and those who are mistreated since you are also in the body. Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Keep your life free from love of money, and be content with what you have, for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear, what can man do to me? This particular text that we're going to be looking at this morning comes right after the writer had just explained to the readers that even though their world around them was falling apart, they were part of something unshakable through Jesus Christ. When, time gets tough, when times get tough and we find ourselves in the midst of, of trying times such as where we're at right now, the world seems to be falling down around our ears. It's, it's, it's just chaos. But, but he, he shows them... That, that our faith is unshakable. That everything else around us may fall apart, but there, when everything else falls apart, all these buildings, everything falls down around our ears, we have our faith. We are part of an unshakable kingdom. And when we grasp that truth, we then respond by living a life that is characterized by thanksgiving. We respond by offering acceptable worship. We worship God because he has the power to consume everything. Yet, the beauty of this is God spares, he protects, and he provides in our time of need. So as we unpack this text, I want to set out a definition of what worship really is. And that, that is defined, it's either defined as a verb or a noun. As a verb, it means to show honor or reverence. And as a noun, it means an act of expressing, expressing reverence to a divine being. Of course, God is the object of our worship, and this morning... I want to show you what this particular text shows is acceptable worship and, and, and how that will affect our daily lives. So the first thing I want to show us this morning is take care of one another. The writer tells us right away, he says, let brotherly love continue. This is nothing more than showing compassion toward other people. It's a caring for the well-being of others. It's not a self-centered act. The word there is actually Philadelphia. We, uh, it is literally translated brotherly love. It's the love of brothers. But 
I want, I want to show you some, some of how this, this plays out through Scripture. Jesus told the religious leaders of the time the second and greatest commandment, which he said was just as important as loving God, was to love your neighbor as yourself. So he, said, he puts it on equal footing with loving God. If you love God and you love your neighbors, it's just as important to love your neighbors. But when, it, when, asked, uh, when asked by people about who qualified as a neighbor, watch what Jesus does. Jesus responds with a parable. He, he, he talks about a, a Jewish man that had gotten mugged along the side of the road. Guys had beat him up and uh, took all of his belongings and all of that. And his fellow countrymen had passed him by. All the other uh, Jewish uh, people had passed him by. But then along comes this Samaritan. This Samaritan uh, stops by and helps him get back on his feet. Now, I know for many of us, that doesn't amount to a hill of beans. But, but here's the thing. The Samaritans in the, in the early first century were considered half-breeds. For your Harry Potter fans, they would call them mudbloods. But... The, the, they were considered half-breeds, they were considered impure Jews, and they were not to be, they were not to have contact with them. So they would, they would avoid them uh, with, with every, everything that they had. They were basically social outcasts. So the social outcast comes by and helps this, uh, helps this Jewish person, regardless of, of social status, uh, what, whatever uh, his ethnic background was or anything like that. And Jesus' point into this whole story is is that we are all neighbors we're all in this together we all are part of the human race brotherly love takes many forms but watch what the writer of hebrews how he sums it up there in verse 16 he says do not neglect to do good and share what you have for such sacrificing sacrifices are pleasing to god these are the sacrifices that god's find god finds pleasing when we share with others that are in need or Maybe even not if they're really in need. But, but out of the kindness of our heart, this is what God finds pleasing. And this is the point of worship. The point of worship is to please God. When we take care of the needs of others, we put our faith into action. It's no longer just something we talk about. It's not something we give lip service to. But it's something that is visible and outward. And according to James, watch what he says in, in, in James chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. He says, if a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Now, I'm not saying that we have to work to maintain our salvation. However, if we walk by somebody and we know the right thing to do and we neglect to do it, that's not putting our faith into action. And now we find ourselves in a situation that is, is completely overrun with need. So we need to take care of one another. But not only do we need to take care of one another, watch what he does here. We need to be welcoming to strangers and outsiders. The writer uses an example here in verse 2. He uses a, an example from Genesis chapter 18 and 19. So Abraham's on his journey to the promised land, and a couple of guys show up at his tent, and he welcomes them in, offers them a hot meal, comfortable uh, seats, and, and things like that. Come to find out, these were angels that God had sent to him to bring a message. Now, if Abraham would have turned them away, he would have missed the announcement that his wife was about to uh, have a child. And that this would have been the child that he had so been waiting for. So if he would have turned these guys away, he would have missed out on God's promise and God's blessing. And so we, when, we, when we show hospitality, and what is hospitality? Well, hospitality is a friendly and generous reception and entertainment of guests, visitors, or strangers. By definition, uh, that, that's what we get. So when, when uh, this raises the question, how do we treat others when we come across them? Our paths cross people for a reason. And I firmly believe that there's a reason why we enter into conversations with people. There's a reason why people come into our lives. Maybe it's, it's someone new in your life, someone you've never met before. Maybe it's been a long time friend. But Jesus said, Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. He said, do to others as you would have them do to you. This should be driving us when we interact with people. This raises an important point that we all have to consider. This is not just some proverb. This is, we call it the golden rule, but, but this is not just some proverb that some 
uh, smart guy made up uh, just a few hundred years back. Jesus said this, and this is the word of God. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Treat people with the same way you wanted to be treated. We should always be relating to others the way we want them to relate with us. Jesus never approached strangers with condemnation. He never approached them with judgment in his heart. He approached them with compassion and understanding. And now, more than any other time in our, our history, we need this. We need compassion. We need mercy. We must not see people as outsiders. For once, every single one of us is in the same boat. Now more than ever, Christians have to rise up and show compassion for their neighbors. But not, not only do we need to be welcoming to strangers and outsiders, watch what happens here. We need to reach out to those experiencing hardships. Verse three there, the writer says, remember those who are in prison as though in prison with them. What he's calling the, the reader to do is relate to people that are experiencing hardships. Remember those who are in prison as though you were in prison with them. He was, he was writing to this audience that had friends, possibly relatives, that had been in jail for their faith. And some of them were probably facing death. Now the jails of that time were not exactly uh, pretty places, if you will. Uh, the, the jail that, that Paul sat in was actually down in the sewers. And so, you know, to, by today's standards, that would be cruel and unusual punishment. But that was the norm for them. But, but here's, here's what the writer's calling to say. Christians are all part of one body, and that is the body of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the head of the body. He moves the entire of the body as he wills, and we have to join him as a body in one united front in these times of hardship. So what does that look like in your personal context? We may not be able to get close together, but we all have neighbors. Most, most every one of us have neighbors unless you live on a thousand acre ranch. But, but here's the question, what do you know about your neighbors? What are they experiencing right now? If you don't know about your neighbors, now, now is the time to reach out to them. See what you can do personally for them. Mission work starts in your own backyard. Use your backyard as your Jerusalem your front yard even, but even, even something as simple as a prayer or a word of encouragement, that goes a long way right now. I, I tell you, I sat down the other day and I texted a couple of friends of mine, I know that, that are nurses, and I, I just, it was a simple message that said, hey, I just wanted you to know that I prayed for you this morning and I pray that God keeps you safe through all of this. And, and they, they, the response was, thank you, that really meant a lot to me. Because sometimes people just need to know that, especially if you know somebody that's on the front lines of this. They, they may be struggling with exhaustion, maybe frustration. They, maybe they just want to give up, but send a word of encouragement to somebody. Reach out to somebody today. Just offer compassion, and you'd be surprised how far that would go. So we reach out to those experiencing hardships, but I want to, I want to show you something else here. We're stuck at home. Focus on building or rebuilding family relationships. Verse, verse 4 here says, let marriage be held in, in honor among all. This is the front line of ministry for anyone. Well, well the call here is fidelity in the relationship. It, I, I think it goes beyond just simple fidelity. Many of us, we, we have plenty of time on our hands right now. Uh, we're, we're going to be living on top of each other in another week or so. Tempers are going to start flaring. Agitations are going to come in. Now is the time we have to spend to connect with our family. There's going to be difficult seasons ahead once cabin fever starts setting in, if you haven't already experienced it. You may find yourself in a position that you may not want to be in your own home right now. But now is the time to, to take a step back. Work on your relationships with your family. You've got your family and your kids surrounding you. Take some time. And I want to I challenge the men right now. Now more than ever, the home needs spiritual leaders. Embrace your role as the God-given spiritual leader of the home. Take care of your family's spiritual need. Don't rely on a pastor or a staff member. You are the spiritual leader. If you don't know where to get, begin, don't hesitate to give me a call. Contact me, email me, whatever. I will help you through this. But I know for many of you, 
this may seem awkward trying to develop a family time of Bible study or developing prayer time. Praying out loud for a lot of people, even me, is, is a little bit awkward at times. You just don't know what to say. You don't know how to say it. But trust that God will give you what you need. Take a bold step today. Men, lead your family in a small worship service at home. Anytime during the week. It doesn't have to be on Sunday. May, maybe you all find some downtime. Maybe you've run out of Netflix. Take, take some time and say, hey, let's be a family. Play some board games. Just join each other with a family. But, but you will see how God will honor that. And the last thing I want to share with you this morning is to trust in God completely. The last part of this text is arguably the most important thing to remember. The writer calls us to change our focus from the worldly to pleasing God. He says here, he says, keep your life free from, love, from the love of money and be content with what you have. Now there's a balance here. Doing what we must to provide for our families and living for something that will never make us complete. Now, now I'm not saying that money is a bad thing. I'm not saying you need to go give all of your money away, okay? And I know some of you are probably sitting there saying, well, the Bible says money is the root of all evil. Let me, uh, let me show you that. In, uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 10, this is what it says. But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Now if you underline it, here it is. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. What it's calling us here is monitor your focus. It's not a bad thing to, to earn money. It's not a bad thing to be rich. But when that becomes your focus, you lose sight of what you're, what you're really here for. When, we, when our focus shifts from what is necessary to what is excess, then we find the temptation to, to do the things that are not necessarily good or even not necessarily uh, within what God's expectation is. But that's where we find ourselves going astray. The, the encouragement here is to be content with what you have. We, we live in a society that has bred a keeping up with the Joneses mentality. That can lead to disaster. We spend so much time trying to keep up with our neighbors, trying to have the, the bigger, better stuff. Uh, but be careful with your focus. Maybe you find yourself today not knowing if you're going to even have a job on the other side of this. But I want to encourage you today, this will pass. The promise here in verse 6 is that God will never leave you nor forsake you. And knowing that God is with us every step of the way, that's what gives us hope. That's what gives us confidence. And nothing in this world can shake that. And at the end of the day, we are part of this unshakable kingdom. As Christians, we have a hope. This is only temporary. This life is only temporary, but this situation is only temporary. Now, for the moment, we have what we have. The church exists. I want you to hear me here. The church exists for moments like this. We may not be able to meet together for worship as a body, but that's not the point of the church. The whole point of the church is to get out into our communities. We're not alone in this. And I want to tell you, churches all across the globe are finding themselves in the same position. Now, I don't want to be all doom and gloom, but we need to brace ourselves for a big storm to come. Emotionally. Somebody you know is going to be affected by this pandemic. And I, I pray that the church will step up to meet those needs. The emotional needs of people. Okay? But now... Don't, don't hear what I'm not saying here. I'm not saying that we need to go out and uh, violate the city ordinances that have been set out for us because Scripture does call us that we need to heed our leaders because they are in place by God. But there are things that you can do in your personal context today that can affect a person's life for the better. I would encourage each of you to reach out to one of your neighbors this week. Talk to them. See what their needs are. 
Maybe, maybe you can't offer them something financially, but you can offer an ear. You can be a shoulder to cry on. You can be support for somebody. Even a prayer. Pray with somebody outside of your house today. Lead your family to learn what it's like to serve God in your own particular Jerusalem. God will bless that. God will honor that beyond anything you can imagine. I know for some of you, things may seem stressful right now. Incomes are slowing down. Uh, perhaps you're out of work and maybe not getting paid. Uh, the insecurity of not knowing uh, if you'll have a job next month or, or even if you're going to be able to pay the bills. But, but if, you, if you spend this time focusing on what, what God would have you do, now's the time for each of us to take a step back. We have lots of time. Now's the time for each of us to take a step back and ask God what he's calling us to do. God will be faithful to honor the promises that Jesus set out for us in Matthew chapter 6. He says, Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all of these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Tomorrow will bring with it a whole new set of issues. It'll bring with it a whole new set of situations and worries, but for today, focus on how we can worship God by caring for our neighbor, strangers, outsiders, our families, and everything else will fall into place. If you've not placed your faith in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I would encourage you to do that today. It's, it's not rocket science. Scripture says that we have all sinned and we fall, all fall short of the glory of God. But in Jesus Christ, he came and he lived to that standard that we could not live. And he took on that sin for us. Scripture says that he became sin who knew no sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. All we have to do is place our faith in Jesus Christ that he was he, he, was, he died, was buried, and resurrected for our sins. If you haven't placed your faith in Jesus Christ, it's as simple as admitting that you're a sinner, believing that Jesus died for your sins and confessing your sins to God and saying that you believe in Jesus Christ. We don't have to work for our faith. We are saved by grace. It is a gift of God. It is a free gift. And if you've never accepted Jesus in your life today, don't wait especially in these uncertain times. If you, if you were to stand before God today and he says, why should I let you into my heaven? And, you could, and, and all you can say is, I don't know. I hope I was good enough. I want to tell you, you can be confident knowing if you just place your faith in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you will be guaranteed a spot in eternity. Again, if there's, if there's something that, that I or the church can do for you, Please go to our website, fill out our contact form, send us a message. If you, if you placed your faith in Jesus today for the first time, or maybe you want to renew your commitment to, to Jesus, fill out one of those contact forms. Send us your information. We don't know if we don't hear from you. If you have some needs, maybe you just want prayer, go to our website. Fill out that contact information, and I will contact you. We, we will, I will get to you. I will get to you. I will pray with you. I'll do whatever I can to meet your needs. If there's something that you just want to get off your chest, let me know. I'll be happy to listen to you. Although we can't gather together physically, we can still be together in our hearts and minds. And I'm going to tell you what, I, this is okay for me being an introvert. I like the small crowds, but I still miss everybody. And over, over the next week or so, I'm going to try and get out and, and visit people. So if you, if, you want to, if you want me to just stop by and say hi, I'll even talk, through you, talk to you through your, through your window. But if you need something, please don't hesitate. Let me know, and I will do everything I can for you. Thank you again for joining us. And uh, before, we, uh, before we end the service this morning, I'd like to uh, pray for us. Pray for each other. Uh, give somebody a call this week and just say, hi, I was thinking of you, and I prayed for you. Maybe pray over the phone. Uh, again, there's, there's, there's ways we can work without, uh, without actually uh, having to come in contact with each other. But again, thank you for joining us this morning. I appreciate it, and I, I do definitely look forward to seeing everybody again soon. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, we thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy. 
as we go on about our days, Lord, let us not forget these lessons. Help us to uh, look for your divine appointments that you set up for us, that we can uh, uh, minister to those in need. God, build our families through this time. Lord, draw us closer together. Let us not get stressed and worried about all of life. Let it help us to rely on your promises, knowing that you are going to be there every step of the way, that you are still in control, you are still on your throne. God, help us to remember that this is not a surprise to you. We pray that you will use this situation for your glory, that you will reach people uh, through this. In spite of these seemingly uh, un uh, seemingly uh, difficult times, we pray that you will be with everybody here this morning, everybody that's listening. And God, I pray that you will strengthen this body, that we will come out on the other side of this stronger than we ever were before. Help us to embrace these, these rapid changes and help us to learn to walk with you. God, as we go through the week, I pray that you will strengthen everybody, that you will give them courage and confidence uh, for the week. Be with those that are on the front lines, those that are working in hospitals, those that are coming in contact with this virus daily. God, I pray that you will keep them safe and that you will keep their families safe through all of this. And God, we thank you. We love you. We praise your name. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a wonderful week, everybody. Take care of yourselves and be safe.